I hope you're having a great day. I think um, it's been absolutely amazing. The hair is stand still standing on the back of my neck. Um, I suppose what we've seen is that uh, brilliance and intelligence is massively diverse. And I suppose one of the great things about working in, in a university is that, well, this is basically what I live amongst all the time. The only thing that changes in university is that I get older, the people who come stay exactly the same age. And so um, it's like being trapped in the portrait of Dorian Gray or something, whereas I, where I am the picture, basically. Um, so I suppose I want to talk to you a little bit about artificial intelligence. You hear a lot about it in the media. And um, I suppose there's, there's a few things that are interesting about this. Um, First of all, I suppose I'm calling, I'm putting this prism up there for a few reasons. I suppose there's two directions to this thing. So I suppose one is, the, is that the world is massively diverse, brilliance is massively diverse. Um, I often tell people who are worried about artificial intelligence that they shouldn't fear it. What we should really feel is real stupidity. Um, and of course, there's a lot of that, right? Um, so, but of course, the other direction of the prism, and of course, prisms don't really work that way, but they do, in, at least in the picture, is that there is a need for all sorts of intelligences to come together to solve the world's problems. Um, and so, by the end of this talk, I hope I'll have convinced you that AI is not a technical problem any longer. It's partly technical, but it needs lots of other diversity. It needs, it needs academics and experts from all different fields to come together to solve all of these problems. Um, I suppose coming back to intelligence and the nature of intelligence, one of the things that we often wonder about is, well, what is it? And would we recognize it if we saw it? Um, Bill Bryson has this sort of amazing quote in, um, in one of his books, which is true, which is that if you took a tweezers and you're able to pick yourself apart one atom at a time, what you would end up is a pile of atoms that were never alive, but all of them together were you. And of course, if you took a plank of wood and you did exactly the same thing, you oddly would end up with exactly the same set of atoms, none of which were originally that piece of wood. And I suppose you might ask the question, well, what's the difference between a human being and um, a plank of wood? And I suppose the only question I can give you is, well, some people are indistinguishable from planks of wood. Um, um, so that's, that's the only thing I can say. I suppose, just to give you, we've always been, so, and the same is true of intelligence, so while that, while that little pile of atoms was never alive, it also was never intelligent. And so where does intelligence come from and what is it? And guess what, after many, many centuries and years of artificial intelligence research, we have a very, we have a very smart answer to that question, which is we don't know. So, but we are still fascinated by it, we've been fascinated by it for centuries. So, it was recently the 200th anniversary of the publication of Frankenstein. And this, in a sense, is a story about, um, about I suppose, the human question of whether we can build something in our likeness. And, of course, it was a dreadfully tragic story in many respects, um, where Frankenstein earned for love. And, of course, we've heard this morning that, uh, how important love is to human beings. Um, last year was also, oddly, the uh, 50th anniversary of the screening of Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey which amongst being a sort of a, a 60s trippy movie, um, has at the core of it a rather soft-spoken but very deadly artificial intelligence called Hal, um, who eventually kills every human being on the, uh, on the spacecraft. This year, uh, the story is that uh, we are going to be living in the 50th anniversary of, uh, we're gonna be living in, in sorry, in Blade Runner, no, Bill, the original Blade Runner is set in uh, 20, uh, November 2019. Um, and all of these movies, of course, bear no resemblance at all to reality. And so, um, an interesting point about Blade Runner is that they've just released a new Blade Runner, which is Blade Runner uh, 2049, which is to give us a bit more time to actually build that sort of dystopian world. Um, um, but I don't think that's what AI is all about. I think we fear it, but we shouldn't fear it. As I say, we should feel um, real stupidity. Um, it's sort of ironic in a sense to be uh, giving this talk in this room because the, I'm not sure whether you're aware, but that big stained glass window behind us was dedicated to this man. When he died, uh, this is Professor George Boole, he was the first professor of mathematics here at UCC. Um, and while he was here in UCC, he wrote this uh, book the, um, known as The Laws of Thought. Um, and he's up there on the bottom, on the bottom row in the middle wearing, um, wearing a black tunic with purple sleeves. And he basically uh, looked at the question of how do you automate thought? 
Um, and of course, we can argue whether he got it right or wrong. I think AI today is more about personal data. It's more about large amounts of data. It's more about computing. It's more of all of these sorts of things. So it's not really the core of intelligence at all. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about it a bit, a bit more later. Um, probably the greatest genius ever to live in computer science was this man, Alan Turing. And I suppose there's a few things that resonate here. Uh, Turing didn't live a very long life. He lived until he was in his early 40s. He was a gay man. Um, uh, he had a relationship, he was a very openly gay man, and he had a relationship with someone for which he was tried and given a choice of whether going to prison or to be chemically castrated, which he opted for the latter so he could, he could continue working. Uh, but of course, the effect on his mind was such that uh, he ultimately committed suicide. But he was probably the greatest genius, um, frankly, my, to me, that's ever lived. Um, he is the reason why we are not all currently speaking German. Um, he effectively is a single individual who uh, broke the Enigma machine, which ultimately resulted in the Allies winning the World War. Um, and he had to face some of the greatest questions, the most difficult moral questions ever posed to human beings. So, for example, once he broke the Enigma, of course, they couldn't, they couldn't use all of the information they were getting from the Enigma because, because that would reveal the fact that they had broken the Enigma. And so he and others had to make the decision about essentially which lives they would save and which lives they would not. But in AI, he coined the imitation game, which is this test for intelligence. So when do we know something exhibits intelligence? And his test, the Turing test, was basically um, a test. Imagine you're interacting with two things that are behind screens. One of them is a computer. One of them is um, an AI, a computer, a human computer. You get to converse with them. Um, and if you cannot distinguish within some period of time um, which is the human, which is not the human, then essentially the, the machine has exhibited artificial intelligence. Um, there's an artist in the UK who has produced a thing called Lady Shatterley's Tinderbot. And what Lady Shatterley's Tinderbot does is it takes dialogue from Lady Shatterley's lover and it uses it uh, to seed uh, chat on Tinder. And um, it fools about 5% of women. Women see through this thing immediately. About 75% of men are fooled by this. So, so we could say that AI has been reached at least for men on Tinder. Um, um, so going back to the field of AI, um, of course, these are the guys who basically coined the term. And in the 1950s, because academics in the US are only paid for nine months of the year, they have to occupy themselves on projects for three months of the year. And these guys got together in Dartmouth in the 1950s, 1956 to be exact, um, coined the phrase artificial intelligence and thought that they could, act, they could automate everything about human intelligence in about 12 weeks. Um, we're still at least 12 weeks away from artificial intelligence. <laughs> um, but without these guys, we would not have, um, we would have coined these questions. The fellow on the far right here is Claude Shannon, who probably wrote the most famous master's thesis in computer science. And he was the guy who blew the dust off of the work of George Boole and showed that it could be used basically to build a computer. And, from the, and the rest of that is uh, history. The fellow in the middle uh, with the glasses and the dark jacket is Marvin Minsky, who um, was a phenomenal genius at MIT. Um, two of the, at least two of the people on this photograph uh, won Nobel Prizes, not in computer science, but for economics. The fellow with the big smiley head on the left-hand side is Ollie Selfridge, who, um, who I knew for many years, and he is the great-grandson. He's the grandson of Mr. Selfridge, of Selfridge Stores. Um, and Ollie was one of the most brilliant people you could ever imagine. AI today is all around us. Every one of us has touched AI in some sense this morning. We might have used a sat-nav. We might have used Google Search. We might have used... Um, well, certainly lots of photographs have been taken. Um, we might have, um, some of us might even have uh, some sort of automation at home, a Siri or um, an Alexa or something. Uh, so AI is everywhere. Um, so since 1996 up, up, up until today, there's been a transformation in AI. AI has basically gone from something which was compute heavy to something which is data heavy. Um, and while there's been massive successes, I argue that AI has made, has given very, has shed very little light on what it is to be intelligent. And the reason I say that is because all of us as children, and indeed all of us as adults, have a thing in our skulls, our brain, which consumes about seven watts of power. Most of modern AI systems consume vast amounts of power, more power than you would consume in, seven th in several thousand lifetimes. They consume massive amounts of data, more data than you will ever see or experience in your entire life, 
and yet they barely can outperform you on very specific tasks. So the nature of intelligence is something that's totally different. So coming back to the question of you know, picking yourself apart and, and ending up with, with a pile of atoms, we could do the same thing with our, with our minds, and we have no understanding of where intelligence comes from. And I suppose the field of artificial intelligence is all about, well, is there something fundamentally different about the substance that's in your skull and how it's put together? and something that is built in silicon in a computer that tries to automate some of that. And we can certainly give you the impression that we're automating some things, but we, we really don't know a lot about intelligence. We certainly know nothing about consciousness. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're making very good progress, I guess, is, this, is a short story, right? Uh, so most of you are probably, you'll hear all the time that people are now terrified of AI, and some of this stuff is justified. So you often hear of Terminator, this red-eyed monster who's going to come over the hills and kill us all. Um, AI is not about that. Um, however, it is about understanding data, um, and of course, it's, a, it's what I call a dual-use technology. It can be used for massive good, it can be used for massive ill. So, for example, um, in China at the moment, there is a social score experiment. Um, there is a Black Mirror episode based on this, where basically every person, every citizen of China has a, has a score, and how well they behave basically dictates their score. If your score falls below a certain level, bad things start to happen. You can't buy rail tickets. Your internet gets very, very slow. It may not even work. Um, your friends start um, to... Uh, not return your calls because their social score is a function of your social score. So you can imagine how this thing can, can get out of control. Um, but I suppose we have to be very careful, and we'll we come back to that too. Um, you often hear of bias, and I think this is something we need to be aware of. And some biases are significant. So, of course, we all know about gender bias and so on. Um, but what we don't know, there are some biases that are inbuilt, and I'll give you a sense of those as we go along, and these are very difficult to overcome. Cathy O'Neill has written a fantastic book, I love the title, Weapons of Mass Destruction, which is about how data and algorithms can be used for ill. But I suppose they can also be used for phenomenal good. Uh, Tay, uh, the, the famous uh, chatbot that Microsoft produced, it does a rather profane um, headline on this article, on this slide. But basically, Tay observed how to interact with human beings by observing human beings on social media, specifically Twitter. And of course, people don't interact with people on Twitter like they do, you know, face to face. Um, and so it learned to be a very offensive um, uh, type of, um, well, almost Trump-like in many respects, one could argue, um, uh, within a very limited amount of time, and Microsoft had to take it down. Um, so observing human beings and how we behave in certain contexts is also not good examples. But I suppose there is hope. There's plenty of hope, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Quite aside from the AI piece, um, 50 years ago on, the, on Christmas Eve, um, these three fellows did something that was rather remarkable. This is the crew of the Apollo 8 NASA mission. Um, so it would, be six, it would be another seven months before man actually stood on the moon. Um, but these guys did something remarkable. As they were coming around the dark side of the moon, they had the wherewithal to replace the black and white film that they had in their cameras with color film, and they produced, they caught this image. So it seems remarkable now that 50 years ago um, really was for the first time that we, that we really saw with our own eyes, so to speak, that the Earth is a little ball that hangs in space. Um, of course, we knew that before, but we'd never actually seen it. And these were the first three human beings to see that, and this, this photograph had a remarkable impact. One of, the, one of the significant impacts it has to this day is that it drove the whole sustainability agenda. So, um, Gro Harlem Brundtland, who was the Prime Minister of, um, of Norway, uh, wrote this report. And this ultimately has become the Sustainable Development Goals. And these are the greatest challenges facing us today. You might ask, where does AI fit into this picture? If you look behind all of these Sustainable Development Goals, there is an opportunity to, saw, to start to address some of these challenges with data, with algorithms, and with artificial intelligence. And I suppose my call to action to you today is to think about how your expertise can be used to inform and solve some of these problems. So, for example, in the context of poverty, there's a whole question of ethics. How do we ensure that, technology, that the benefits of technology are shared equally amongst all citizens? How do we ensure that there isn't a, a technological poor? 
as a consequence of automation, that people don't lose their jobs, that they are deployed, redeployed into other things, and those things are richer than the things that they were doing before. So that it improves everybody's, um, everybody's uh, life in the world. In health, it is certainly the case now that there are lots of medical tasks that can be performed in an automated way on par or maybe even exceeding the capabilities of medics. But there's a fundamental problem. These AI systems cannot tell you why you are sick. They can tell you that merely that you are sick. And of course, this is Victorian medicine in a sense, right? So just knowing that someone is ill isn't enough. And so we need to figure out, well, how do we, art how do we reap the benefits of this technology and help it to um, really solve some big problems? The question of gender bias, this is something that's really, gender equality, something that's really in, baked into society. And just an interesting thing, like we know that, of course, people can, are, um, have uh, implicit biases and so on, but what people don't often know is that language is biased. And so, for example, there's some work that shows that the distance between leadership terms and male, and male identifiers is closer than it is for women, and the distance for caring roles for women and female identifiers is closer than it is for men. And so language itself is actually gender biased. And this is something that we actually don't know how to overcome. There's massive opportunities in, in energy. How do we predict the wind, the weather, um, so that we can ensure that when you turn on your washing machine, that you're doing it at a time when energy is effectively free and green. And we can already start to do that. Um, we can also start to do this in smart cities, and we can also start doing it in farming. And I suppose the point is that all of these issues are not just technological, they raise significant societal challenges and legal challenges, and we have to, we have to address those. And so I suppose the take-home message from this talk is that artificial intelligence is now not just about not doing, not just overcoming real stupidity, it's not just trying to automate what it is in our minds. It's how do we collectively bring together all of our brilliance and our expertise to solve the world's problems. So these are technical. I'm a nerdy mathematician. I can solve some of these things. I'm, I'm a computer scientist. I can build the algorithms. I can build the technology. Do I understand the, uh, the legal consequences and the legal issues associated with that? Not quite. I do somewhat, but not, not as I should. So we need ethicists, we need legal people. How do we understand the impact that that technology has on human beings? How do we deal with people who have sort of special cognitive uh, needs? Uh, and we saw an example of that this morning from a fantastic talk um, about, about autism. We need to solve these problems. It's multifaceted. The, the, the intelligence is as diverse, if not more so, than the, the, the diversity of talent and brilliance that you've seen today. And together, I all encourage you to get involved in AI. We need you badly. Thank you very much.